Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle Legro George. I'm a member of the New England Poetry Club's advisory board, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming you all, uh, audience members and winners, to our annual prize winners reading and serving as your MC for this wonderful event. Before we hear about and hear from our prize winners, a few housekeeping items. Um, one, uh, you should be aware that this meeting or celebration is being recorded. Uh, two, prize winners, we encourage you to share links to your work, to your books, to your websites in the chat so that we can get uh, copies of your books or, or be more familiar with your work uh, through uh, those, those links. Uh, audience members, don't hesitate to show your love in the chat or to use uh, reaction buttons. Typically, when we are at readings, we might grumph seriously hmm. <laughs> or we and holler. So since we can't do that um, uh, via this Zoom room, uh, well, via uh, sort of out loud, I guess, use the chat and also use the reaction buttons uh, freely. Uh, and also just want to uh, thank our wonderful Vice President of the NEPC, Hilary Salek, who is going to be doing the Zoom stuff behind the scenes. So we're, uh, we're grateful to Hilary. Um, all right, so, so we're gonna go ahead and, and start with, uh, with the uh, prizes. So the Samuel Washington Allen Prize is given for a long poem or poem sequence. And this year it was selected, the winner was selected by Lloyd Schwartz, who is here with us and waving to us. And the winner is Denise Provo, or Denise Provo. <laughs> And I'm going to read to you her bio before she reads uh, for us. Denise Provo was, uh, has published in such journals as the Bagel Bard Anthologies, Ibbotson Street, Muddy River Poetry Review, Port Siluni, Quadrille, Poetry Porches, Sonnet Scroll, Sanctuary, and Light Quarterly. She received the Best Love Sonnet Award <laughs> from the Maria C. Faust Sonnet Competition in 2012. Her chapbook, Curious Peach, was published by Ibbotson Street Press in 2019, and her collection, City of Stories, is forthcoming from Gervaina Barva Press. Denise Povo. Thank you, Danielle, and thank you to the New England Poetry Club for this great honor. Thanks to all the officers and the judges and everybody who's here today. And thank you especially to everyone who helped me with this sonnet crown since its inception, you know who you are. Um, I'm going to read the first half of the crown, um, which is called Threads of Distant Music. And I won't read the section numbers, but the, in a crown, the last line of each sonnet repeats as the first line as of the next. So you'll know when the sonnet is changing. Threads of distant music, a garland of sonnets. I clean the dusty floors upstairs and down, scour coffee stains from inside every cup, display domestic virtues I don't own. This evening's full moon rises up so fine, a guardian angel hovering over town. You murmur to me, let's stay out all night. Aunt Magda said that in her mother's prime, Roma came calling with their caravans, blessed with grandfather's yes to use his land. When done with her chores, Paulina, would glide out of their farmhouse to the new-made camp, a thread of distant music her soul guide. She'd see the campfire's flickerings and then wood smoke, folks dancing, strains of violin. Wood smoke, folks dancing, 
strains of violin. A little crowd was clustered in the dark. Paulina moved in, listening, pensive, where women sat with babies in their arms. A young man offered her his violin. He showed her how to draw the bow across, his hand over hers, bow upon the strings. Not difficult, he breathed. Then she was lost, possessed by music she could feel within. Her own granddaughter decades afterwards would tell her girl, Anna, you can't be ours, the gypsies must have left you. So this child believed something about her life was wrong. I'll have to roam to find where I belong. I'll have to roam to find where I belong. Pauline amused, constricted by the farm. She needed dough, tried to recall a song. Papa had said some men might do her harm. Today, he heard horses and hid her in a giant haystack, really just in time. Cossacks arrived, barked questions, looked inside the barn and house, left fast as they'd arrived. A few days later, when their church bells chimed, they walked to worship, frightened, filled with thanks. Mama wept, Papa's thoughtful eyes were dry. Their stoic sons prayed, clenching their rough hands. Later, it's time you married, Papa said. Paulina thought, what might I do instead? Paulina thought, what might I do instead? Could I locate my long gone Roma friend or make my way to that far market town where dark eyed Max plays the accordion? She stood to be blessed in her parents' house, the chosen husband standing at her side, nervous, polite Bogdan. Then they stepped out, just as they'd done before she'd been his bride. The villagers strolled with them to the church. At the virgin's altar, she set her flowers. St. Paul said, better marry than to burn. Yet she burned with these secret thoughts of hers. She said her vows. Did she have any choice? She listened to a disembodied voice. She listened to a disembodied voice, the priest again, Paulina realized, saying burial prayers for her small boy, her firstborn, unexpected when he died. Paulina gazed beyond the wooden fence around the graveyard's edge where flat fields stretched in all directions. She would suffocate if she could not soon get outside that gate. Back home, her husband and eldest brother stepped aside for quiet conversation. They gathered closely to talk with Papa. Paulina, left out, felt indignation. Cossacks had conscripted both men. They'd leave. Paulina would stay here at home to grieve. Paulina stayed back here at home to grieve her second son, his infant life cut short. Paulina yearned for some kind of reprieve from nightmares, from her endless toil and hurt. Her mama counseled prayer. Could she believe in heaven's mercy when she'd suffered so? Her husband summoned her. Now she must go with her brother, headed first to Danzig, from there to Bremen's port, then on a boat bound for America, a distant land. Sick to her stomach every ocean day in steerage, struggling to understand. She wondered if someone had told Bogdan that she would come to him with empty hands. She came to the new world with empty hands, hardly a cent, her boot heels wearing down, ship's manifest listing her as Russian. Their journey took them to a mining town, a dreary place sooted with coal dust. Within a year, Paulina was with child. Coal mines played out, each pay packet held less. Magda was born while they were on the road. They settled, 
searched for a new way to live. Not too long after, Kasia was born. Bogdan went off to work one day, was killed when he fell off some makeshift scaffolding. Paulina, with two small girls, was alone, unable now to earn the passage home. So look for the anthology to find out what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you for this narrative rich uh, in detail of this family's journey and, and these characters' journey. This evening's full moon rises up so fine and then the poem opens up. Thank you so much. The next prize to announce is the Amy Lowell Prize for a poem in any style or form selected by Tony B. I don't know if Tony B is here with us. If she is, Tony, wave. And the winner of the Amy Lowell Prize is Catherine M. Clark. Catherine M. Clark is a professor emeritus uh, of Antioch University, New England. She was born in Vancouver, Canada, and comes to us now from the foot of uh, Mount Monadnock. Her work has appeared in Breath and Shadow, Word Gathering, Northern New England Review, and The Poet's Touchstone. Catherine M. Clark. Thank you. I'm very honored to receive the Amy Lowell Award. She was a woman who, it seems to me, spurred a lot of change challenged convention by her life and her poetry. I'm even more proud that my poem was chosen by Tony B. Tony in her writing and activism, in her words, dares us to be the flame that sparks the change, to be the change that sparks the flame. I'm grateful to be in their good company, along with the other prize winners and all of you today. To say a quick word about my poem, living with a physical disability has been a challenge I've lived with all my life. I was a six-year-old with a tiny wooden cane, and now I'm a woman in a shiny red wheelchair. One of the ways I managed over the years was to not talk about it, just to get on with it. And people would say, I never think of you as disabled. As a woman who loves women and taught here in Cambridge, Mass, at the Jesuit School of Theology for 11 years, I also learned not to talk about that part of my experience. My life was an enactment of show, don't tell. Since I began to write poetry about five years ago, I've learned a lot from some wonderful teachers about how to show experience in a poem. But what was much harder is the telling. Speaking of the deeper dimensions of my life that I have rarely spoken of. Fortunately, I found my way to a wonderful teacher, a member of NEPC, Pam Bernard, and Pam helped me understand that what mattered above all was voice, the ability to speak my own truth in my poems. This poem is part of my effort to tell. Consider the fingers. It starts with the brush of her fingers on mine as we reach for the check. Later, she touches my cheek, lays a hand on my neck until one stroke 
opens me and she slides inside my life, helping me build a garden, pink geraniums, purple lobia, alyssum, and a spike of dracaena, patio pots to enjoy after the surgery. When she waits for hours until I swim, conscious again in my room, to feel her hand grasp my shoulder, like a lifeguard lifting me out of the deep. She stays that summer until the night. She places one finger saying, don't move and kisses me until I beg her never to leave again. When we marry, she slips a ring onto me, moist from her palm, and I promise forever. Now the gold band has worn a groove into my finger. Her hands are cool on my hips, assuring me she's got me as I struggle to stand got me so close, she can draw me to her instantly, should I lose my balance, cradle me against her to hold me up, or gently, when it's time, to let me go. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. There's such a beauty and tenderness in that poem. Uh, and she slides inside my life uh, like a lifeguard lifting me out of the deep or lines that, that uh, were particularly striking for me as a listener. Thank you and congratulations. The next prize is the uh, Der Hovenessian Prize for translation which was selected uh, by Jean-Dany Yorke. And I don't know if Jean-Dany is here, but thank you Jean-Dany for serving as judge. And the recipients of that prize are Zvinya Orlowski and Ali Kinsella. And I will read their bios to you. Zvinya Orlowski is a pushcart prize poet, translator, and a founding editor of Four Way Books. She is the author of six poetry collections, including Bad Harvest, a 2019 Massachusetts Book Awards must read in poetry, therefore you must read it, and a recipient of a 2016 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Translation Fellowship. Ali Kinsella has been translating from Ukrainian for eight years. Her published works include essays, poetry, monographs, and subtitles to film. I think this is probably a first for us in NEPC. She holds an MA from Columbia University where she wrote a thesis on the intersection of feminism and nationalism in small states. A former Peace Corps volunteer, Ali lived in Ukraine for nearly five years. Zvinya and Ali. Hi, thank you. I just sent the baby away. She's <laughs> whining. Um, so Dvinya and I have translated the works of Natalka Dila Tsarkivits, who was a relatively important poet in Ukraine in the early 90s, in the, the first um, post-independence generation. This generation is often called the Visim Desyatniki, or the eight years. And it's um, a bit of a misnomer, but it sort of refers to when they and kind of came into their own and has um, less to do with poems that were being published in the 80s and more about where they were in the 80s. And Natalka herself is actually more of a, a 70 year, which is not really a recognized generation in the Ukrainian arts. Um, but it means that she sort of straddled the two generations, the two big literary uh, movements in the recent Ukrainian literary memory. Um, and for this, she is, um, I would say, slightly less well known in the West. She 
all of those big Ukrainian poets that you're also familiar with. She's not among them. Um, and so Natalia, or I'm sorry, Tvinia and I sought to correct that with our, our new collection that comes out hopefully later this month, uh, Eccentric Days of Hope and Sorrow. And so the poems that we're reading today, it's a short cycle called Allergy. And I just wanna give you, um, I have a, a note for each poem and I will read them before I read the poem so that you don't, don't forget. Um, so for this first one, um, it's just important to know that these, this, um, the cycle comes from a book called Allergy, which came out in 1999, and the early 90s in Ukraine were a time of um, just an explosion of new political parties, and it was hard to know which ones were serious and which ones are not, and they often paid their supporters to come out and, you know, rah, rah, rah for them in whatever colors they were wearing, and it also coincides with a fanatical sect called the White Brotherhood, that made an attempt in the early 90s to seize the most famous cathedral in Ukraine, which is called St. Sophia's. So I'll read um, part one. Ці дні прожити нами, видишли до інші дні прожити нами. Лягли на брук масні криваві плями, то ще їх змили. Майво прапорі більш не рождає хтіхи, ні надії. І тільки танки страху на Майдані Такого ж понеділкового дня. Дні пережити нами, як трава у нашому саду, руда і жовтява. Наш бідний сад, мов очманілий пава, летить нікуди з криком ні про що. Криклива осінь, мов на дзвін соборний, зайшлися юрби ідіотів, чорних, червоних, синіх, і летять з гори листівки про нові умови гри. Allergy. These days we lived disappeared into other days we also lived. Greasy, bloody stains on a gravel path. Rain washed them away. A rustling of flags no longer brings delight or hope, only terrifying tanks on the Maidan on a Monday afternoon. Days we've survived, like grass in our garden, ruddy, yellow, brown, poor garden, a mad peahen flying nowhere, squawking about nothing. Autumn clangs as loudly as church bells, calling crowds of fools to flock in black, red, blue. Flyers drift from above, proclaiming new rules of the game. For part two, um, there's just a, a brief little note here. Um, the ref, there's a reference to a Taras Shevchenko poem. Um, his poem is called uh, Yurodovi, Holy Fool. And he says, when will we get to Washington with the new and just law? We'll indeed get there someday. Uh, and Taras Shevchenko was writing in the late 19th century. Um, he's the big voice in Ukrainian letters. Um, there's statues of him all over the country. <laughs> so here is Natalka's take on that. Починається знов алергія. Мабуть, до опалого листя, до сухого пілку хризантем та останні жоржі, доконаючи гід в бурину. Або, може, до того неспокійного виразу плавнів та голих лугів, тоскно, глухо в селі. Втім, і в місті гнитять жербаки в переходях з пропитими пиками, нежить, потім ще ця кусюча дрібна мрашва, що заноситься разом з піском на зуті до помешкань. Одна тільки втіха, жити їй лише до першого снігу. Розмови, черги, інфлюенса, постійна хатня метушня, цибулі смаженої запах і комунального прання. Дитина ниє, телевізор співа про волю ось яку, і президент летить до Менська в жовто-блакитнім літаку. І демагоги, і демократи, однак глядачі і тупі, і часом хочеться блювати на шаровари золоті, на підмальовані закони, злий денні крам, продажний блиск. Чи ж ти ж демоста, Вашингтона? А, ти ж демоста, який колись. 
Again, my allergy begins maybe to burning leaves, to the dry pollen of chrysanthemums and last dahlias, to the dying bunches of weeds, or maybe it's to that ill at ease look of reed beds and bare meadows, wistful, overgrown in the village. Yet in the city, beggars hound the passageways with drunk faces and runny noses. And, there, there, and then there's that tiny biting ant born on shoes along the dirt to apartments. There's one consolation, it'll live only until the first snow. Conversations, cues, influenza, the constant commotion at home, the smell of fried onions and shared laundry. A child whines, the TV sings about our freedom and the president flies to Minsk in a yellow blue plane. The demagogues and the Democrats are all lazy and dumb, and sometimes you want to puke on their golden trousers on the gussied up laws, pathetic wares, glitter for sale. Will we get to Washington? Yes, we'll get there someday. Uh, and finally, for the third part, the line, unharness your horses, lads, comes from a Ukrainian folk song about two lovers. But um, the reference here is to the Rostov sadist, who is um, Andriy Chikatilo, or also known as Andrei Chikatilo. Um, he was Ukrainian by birth, but he was tried in 1992 for the sexual assault and murder of over 50 women and children in Russia. And he sang that song at his trial. That's the key part. Shouldn't skip that. OK. Боюсь тих, що вийдуть із печер на поклик м'яса і видовищ. Знаю, і там, і там є кров. Якщо розбить комп'ютера або бібліотеку спалити, а ще краще ноти, скрипки, рояли. Ой, які оркестри заграє, і на вишкірені зуби легенький усміх опаде. Боюсь тих, що вийдуть із печер. Їм нічого втрачати, крім кайданів, умовності. Будь ласка, дуже прошу. Добрий день, пане. На добраніч, пані. Проходьте, дякую. Уже шкварчить вогонь, танцюють тіні, і садиш Ростовський співає. Розпирагайте, хлопці, коней. I fear those who will come out of the caves at the call of meat and circuses. I know there's blood there. If you must smash the computers or burn the library, better yet, all sheet music, violins, pianos. Oh, what an orchestra will play and a light smile will fall upon the bare teeth. I fear those who come out of caves. They have nothing to lose but their chains of convention, please and thank you. Good morning, sir. Good evening, ma'am. After you, my pleasure. The fire's already crackling. And the shadows dance and the Rostov Seda sings, unharness your horses, lads. Thank you. Thank you, Ali Zvinia, for those uh, powerful socially engaged poems. And you translators do the important work of, of, of um, bringing us closer together, sort of rendering the world smaller and at the same time enlarging our world. So thank you and congratulations. The next prize to announce is the E.E. E. Cummings Prize for a poem of no more than 21 lines. And this year, uh, the prize was selected by C. Prudence Arsenault. And the winner is Carolyn Oliver. Here is her bio. Carolyn Oliver's debut collection, Inside the Storm, I Want to Touch the Tremble. That is a beautiful <laughs> title <laughs> of a book. Inside the Storm, I Want to Touch the Tremble, uh, which won the Aga Shahid Ali Prize and will be published in uh, 2022 by the University of Utah Press. Carolyn is the editor of the Worcester Review, and you can find more of her poems online at carolynoliver.net. And I think that there should be a link to in the chat that you can access. Carolyn Oliver. 
Thank you, Danielle. And thank you for saying that about the title because I'm always worried that it's too long and pretentious. Um, thank you again. And thank you to the NEPC and thank you to Prudence Arsenault for choosing this very short poem. And I will not belabor it, except to say that if you know Cape Cod at all, you might recognize some of the landscape here. Um, my husband uh, grew up on, on the Cape, uh, on the wrong side of the tracks, literally, and um, proposed to me in January on a beach very much like this one. Salt Marsh. Sun some bloody yolk leaking when we wreck on the marsh. The blue cows perjure themselves, reeds scintillate, shatter light against low clouds, grainy insides of pears, seated with night. And if you hunger to, darling, cover me like a cathedral. Make me a new sky, paint me in stars, stars curled over my vaulted arches, and in every corner, I will hold you. Woo, <laughs> I, just, I just have to say that. Wow, um, terse and at the same time, moving, cinematic, uh, cover me like a cathedral. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Carol, and congratulations. The next prize is the Jean Pedrick Chapbook Prize, selected by Heather Tressler. And the winners of the prize this year are Kendra DiColo and Tyler Mills. Kendra DiColo is the author of three poetry collections, including I'm Not Trying to Hide My Hungers from the World, another wonderful title, um, published by Boa Editions in 2021. And Tyler Mills lives in Brooklyn. She's the co-author with Kendra DiColo of Low Budget Movie, um, published by Diode Editions in 2021, and author of City Scattered, published by Tupelo Press in 2022. Hawk Parable, published by Akron Poetry, which won the Akron Poetry Prize in 2019, and Tongue mm. Lear, or Lyre, Lear, Tongue Lear, um, which won the Crab Orchard Series and Poetry First Book Award in 2013. Kendra DiColo is not with us, but Tyler will represent both herself and Kendra. Congratulations, Tyler and Kendra. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to Heather Tressler and the New England Poetry Club, Danielle, Mary, and Hillary for this honor. Yes, Kendra is not here, but she's here in, here in spirit. Um, and she's on maternity leave. So I'm representing both of us today as I read from our collaborative chat book. And we conceived of this project of persona poems in Wellfleet, Massachusetts, um, one one time one day in 2000 or before the 2016 election. And the poems in this book were written during a time of rage and protest. Um, and we were also thinking about low budget films and films we loved, and also how a small budget for a film might be a million dollars, but that would be ridiculously huge for a poem. Um, so the persona poems all engage with those things. And the first half of the book plays with the idea of film and filmmaking and the male gaze. Um, and the second half wrestles more broadly with misogyny. And so we originally thought of this book as being called Spite and Joy. Um, and you'll see that there's humor and love and anger and play and all those things in the poems. And there's also Dunkin' Donuts, which I had to mention since this is a New England Poetry Prize reading. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll read some poems from the chat book um, and thanks again. Love poem with whippets and HGTV. Call me sweetheart when you fiddle with the hotel TV reception. Kiss me like a scratch ticket with one foil moon left to scrape, and I'll soak in the jacuzzi of your ambivalence, sip from paper cups blessed with saved up spit, swallow you in my open concept living room. Yes, I'm a sucker for HGTV. Don't we all get off to granite countertops? Let me swish a while in your curls. Call me crazy, but I'll slip two fingers into your bad cock work while we wait for the voiceover that narrates our suspense like rare shimmers of sludge deep in a well. 
you and me, two lovers huffing a tank of nitrous that never expires. Watching Magic Mike with John Waters at the Provincetown movie house. John Waters holds his disappointment like a god blessing the room as if to say, this is what you call holiness. This sprawl of imitation glitz, gaudy as a museum gift store paperweight. Or why look above when splendor is all around us? The stickiness of bodies, a defiance to the pristine chill where we've taken refuge from the July 4th mob, obscene as a pool party sometimes. And I still can't help but feel like we become close to Magic Mike by wanting him. So I'm the star of my own jump scene when I bolt up from my seat and swivel like an ambient stuffed pinata to read fortunes in the bottle caps of leaders of Mountain Dew. A star lives in our blood, John Waters explains, extraterrestrial life hovering around our mouths while we stay silent as Greek statues at the Met. Look at this utopia. The stripper meets the girl next door and they have clean sex have appearing like one of Yeats's wild swans that cool in my mind. And he pays for everything and no woman is getting punched or strangled. John Waters, you are real to me as a desire to hold on to something ungodly in this theater near the sea that scrubs the beach like a street cleaning brush. Instead of wads of cash, you hold garter snakes in your pocket, gold glitter under your collar and Vincent Van Gogh's face silk screened over your heart. This is called Prop Mistress. For the kitchen scene, we bought a double basin farmhouse sink for $450 online. And the walls, so yellowed with 40 years of cigarette smoke. Teenagers have climbed in and out of joy through the basement window for generations and now pocket needles of blood brown heroin. How the gray streaked town sleep through the nickel gray sleet of February. How a toddler sucks the life out of a thumb and waits by the door of the family dollar in snowman pajama pants smeared with ash. It was easy to buy this farmhouse no longer on a farm for the project. The kitchen hardly different from the 1960s. What is a hard difference? How much is or isn't? For $300, we bought a GE fridge with that unmistakable silver handle locking everything in. And we washed the walls with pans of sudsy dawn, wiped that vintage botanical paper down, those olive green leaves the size of six week old kittens with fronds growing groovy into a beige background. Five rolls of it, 500 bucks. Now all we need is a woman like me to sit at the teal formica table, her reflection warped in the steel rib of a charred spoon while she counts stacks of bills and rolls them up in her canary lingerie, the kind you pay for a quarter of your paycheck at Neiman's, her blonde quaffed bob like sculpted gelatin, a little bit sinister in its precision, not one hair out of place, as she waits for the hand of the clock to stroke 3 p.m. Her signal to smear matte cream over the fresh bruise under her eye, stash her husband's money in a drawer, throw on a $200 robe, and greet the children as they stumble through the door, asking why the house smells like sugar, my mom looks like a fairy, your eyes ringed and sparkly. Let's see. I think I'll just, um, I'll read two more poems. And this one, I always laugh when I'm reading this, <laughs> even though I, I always want to read it. Um, so when Kendra and I wrote these poems together, sometimes we kind of tried to write ourselves into corners or like kind of leave someone, you know, leave a line half finished and kind of think, hmm, what will she do with this one? And so I especially see that happening in this poem whenever I re-encounter it on the page. So thanks, Kendra. <laughs> Um, women in line. Praise the hands that make a beak, fingertips to thumb, but not the quack, quack, two men mock at us while my sis mother, sister, and I talk about the lost key these turquoise days of August. That particular tenacity of yeast infections from wearing a wet bikini all afternoon inside the orange juice walls of the Dunkin' Donuts, I don't need to describe except for the almost black chocolate moons and stone white vanilla rings that seem so easy to taste anywhere. The starry pinch centers of crawlers whose glazed openings I'd penetrate with my finger as a kid, twirling them like a prize. The cashier, petite and Russian, who studied at the community college would be there every morning while I waited for the bus, brewing coffee and making small talk with Ray who spent the night in an alley nearby. 
She was always kind, even to the men who sucked on her name too long, lurked around for a quick peek of her breasts when she bent down to refill the dispensers. Maybe this is where I learned to smile when a man says you, you'd look better in something tight. Praise my mother who knows this too when she looks at the two men who are now pretending to flap their wings. You can't buy pomegranate juice at Dunkin' Donuts, one of the men jokes, and I want to show him the full-on scoby growing inside my swimsuit, tentacles of bacteria reaching out from this lacy swamp, ask him to cure it for me by rubbing the page of a dictionary with two stray hairs. But women in line don't speak. We look away like crayfish wriggling through the creamed mud of a pond's edge, not cranes opening and closing startled wings on the water. And I have been put there by hymens and the press of an iron and the collective voice of an audience that says, you're not on stage for us, so shut up. Women in line are not in line, but on the merry-go-round of mescaline, these men swallowed together before coddling their cocks in the lodges of their baggy jeans and sneering, our heaven is Hellenic as rape. I had pitied them because even now the heteronormative dictatorship that lingers in my cochlea like earbuds pushed in too far with bad music whispers, no girlfriends, lowly men. Revenge made an errand of me, hungry for itself. I thought I lost the key, my mother said, reaching into the maw of her purse. And for a moment, I saw something other than contempt sprawled across their faces, the desire to have a woman dig deep inside of them to penetrate and retrieve what they didn't know had been lost. And this is the last poem. What to wear to report your stalker to HR. Wear your most earnest look, wear a watch, wear a shirt that says, I did not ask for this. If you wear a skirt with diamond stripes up the seam, the receptionist will say, you look cute. Does this mean you look stalkable? Does this mean if the phone rings and it's him, your voice will erupt into a murder of crows that cloud the hallways so fluorescent lit corners push him away with glossy wings? My friend never reported her murder. That's how it works. She left her husband weeping in their tin roofed shack, the coils of a stovetop counterfeiting a smolder. Her nails were red that day. She left him under the tin roof that some would wanna say was punctuated with stars. The metal, I mean, not her body, how it buckled under heavy rain. He wept and then when he wasn't weeping, he was a cloud. Do not think of her body when you grind the pen, scratching the letters of your stalker's name in thin blue ink. Think, that's how it works. You see him, write him in the spangled cells of your neurons and the cops read your face and see you as him. Keep a diary of his movements, one said, and you thought this, sunflower fields, a tangle of metal rusting in the scrapyard, horses gathering slowly in the distance like a cluster of silver clouds. Wear a whistle, wear a lie-proof coat, wear the wind. The police chief counted my deaths. First, red roses rotting on my windshield. Next, the window of my bedroom framing me in a pilled sky blue bra. Then my house. Rape would be next, he said, with a catch in his breath like a mothy bouquet. As a child, you waited for the wolf to turn belly up, expose the jangled teeth, a mouth of burnt opals. This probably happens to you all the time, the cop smiles. Unlatch your jaw, let the stones fall to his feet. The head of HR finally speaks, looking me up and down. First, my toes mashed into my boots, his eyes dagging, dragging doubt up my legs, and my high neck sweater, my mouth, my eyes. Like a bat adjusting its wings, he shuffles my list of incidents. Just look at this evidence. Who is to say you aren't stalking him? Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Tyler. I, I'm just amazed that this this uh, chapbook, low budget movie, has been has been co-written, and that the poems are so um, exciting and strong. I love what I, what I'll call the the badassery of them, uh, and the surprising uh, metaphors and similes. Um, congratulations to you and and to Kendra. Thank you so much. Next prize, and the last prize. Uh, is the Sheila Martin, Margaret Martin Book Prize, which has two winners this year, Music for Exile by Neisayu de Gans and Blood Feather by Carla Kelsey. The judges were the uh, members of the uh, New England Poetry Club board. And um, I will introduce uh, Neisayu Degans and Car 
Carla Kelsey um, all at the same time, and they will read in that order. Uh, Nesayu uh, Degans is a multi-hyphenate actor and poet. Author of two award-winning chapbooks, she has received fellowships from Kaveh Kanem, the Community of Writers, the Vermont Studio Center, Soul Mountain, and the Rhode Island State Council for the Arts. Her acting credits include off-Broadway, regional and international premieres, classical works, and the indie feature, Equal Standard. Music for Exile, which I had the pleasure of reading along with members of the board, uh, is her first book length collection. And it was published by Tupelo Press in uh, February, 2021. She lives in Brooklyn on the unceded lands of the Munsee Lenape. Congratulations, uh, Nesai. Carla Kelsey is a poet, essayist, and editor whose work weaves together the lyric with philosophy and history. She's the author of five books, most recently, Blood Feather, again, which I read with board members and which we really appreciated, published by Tupelo Press. So we'll hear from Nesayu first. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Am I coming? You can? Okay. Um, thank you to the board of the New England Poetry Club. I was a resident of New England for many years and, and many of the poems in this collection are rooted in New England and I'll read just a few of those. Um, and it's a special delight, the Sheila Margaret Martin Book Prize. My mother's name is Sheila and um, my dear late aunt is Margaret. So there's something <laughs> very, very resonant and special about receiving this particular prize. So thank you again. I, I hadn't planned to read this particular poem, but I, I love being in conversation. Um, and it's such a treat to, to, to share this reading with the other prize winners and to hear your work and to be fed by your work. Um, so this is a sonnet. When I first started writing sonnets, there were many failed sonnets. And this might have been a failed one, except I discovered that John Donne also has an 18 line sonnet. And the title of this one is home movie. So um, thank you, Tyler, for the <laughs> uh, for tossing that baton. Um, home movie, Gretel as la femme Nikita. Yesterday, my brother and his friend Jim took a black marker and scrawled fierce mandalas between my bed and mirror. Mandela survived 27 years in prison but can I survive my father's logic that I have until tomorrow to wash their decalcomania off my walls? I'm stoic, even pedagogic. Scrub really hard, but their graffiti isn't phased. Morning revolts, we are all getting ready for school and for work. Dad stands, steadies his hand, belt twitching like a lava trail. I've grown old, shift my book bag from one cramped shoulder to the next, catch my mother's eye. Is fear life's grand design? He beats her, I step in, he beats me. Well, the canonical lamp blew up, flooded the crash scene of my heart, and that's what set me to running. Um, next is a, a New England poem. It begins with an epigraph. Um, Boston, July 7th, 1763. We hear from Hartford in Connecticut that one day last week, the mate of a vessel lately arrived there from the coast of Africa, being delirious, took a Negro boy into his arms and jumped into the river and drowned himself and the boy. Amulet, outstretched hands as if above the head is life. Head, seed, bell, a note, resound a click, redeem a clack, a quote intoning sighs what life is after. Elbowed ascension, water, dis, winged crick, the whispered crack, loose shakeray, loose shackle, 
the dark wood rattles, the dark wood rattles, mermaid, God's gift, success, friendship, what's salt, what's left, trade limbs, embrace him, snare. So descend, bird in mind, no bush, waves reassembling flight, turquoise, gold, still life. And what I like to gloss after reading that poem is that mermaid, God's gift, success, friendship were all names given to slaving ships. And um, having lived in Providence, Rhode Island for many, many years and um, sensing this history and then this history sort of, you know, re-emerging after many, 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 many years of erasure, that there was a period of time, about 50 years, where more enslaved Africans entered the Americas through the ports of Rhode Island. So very often in our sort of our geopolitical narratives of the US, we often locate that history somewhere other than New England. Um, and I'm often, I'm always grateful for those things that sort of knock at my heart and my imagination, inviting me um, to in silence that erasure. Um, I'm jumping about a little bit. Uh, my poems, I was born in the Caribbean. I grew up in Canada. Hey, Catherine, I grew up in Canada and I've lived in the States now for um, quite a while. And the poems in this book also um, make that trek. And so this next poem is a Caribbean poem, but inspired by another New England poet, the wonderful Marilyn Nelson, um, who often dredges New England history, but also her work with form, I find deeply inspiring. And I first encountered a triolet in the work of Marilyn Nelson. And so this is a triolet. And this is these, this uh, poem comes out of a series of me trekking up Canefield River in Dominica, which is a old volcanic island, black sand beaches, very, very mountainous. And I trekked up with my cousin and we, uh, we finally reached our destination at the Red Rock. At the Red Rock. Here in the shadow of the Red Rock, recline against your pumice throne, graze the cigar bottom and take stock. Here in the shadow of the Red Rock. All is quiet. In the next field, the red cock swaggers. Far away, the airplane drone. Hair in the shadow of the red rock recline against your pumice throne. Become one with the river. Imagine seamlessness and float. Sea drenched gown in a fresh water mirror. Become one with the river. Satiate anchor, salvaged cross, hammered out of life's blue notes. Become one with the river. Imagine seamlessness and float. Spider the mountain's laughter, water, blood trumpet, cradled cup. Uncoil your dark long locks, daughter. Spider the fresh mountain laughter, caught her. Become the brass riot of your own French quarter. Your heart, a new red hibiscus, O oh, spider, O oh, daughter of mountainous laughter, blood trumpet, cradled cup. Um, and I think I'll read one final poem. It's a Canadian poem. Uh, when I was very little, we lived on the, a small town on the shores of Lake Huron. And um, we've mentioned Elizabeth Bishop a couple of times very much drawn to her work. And again, right, the, the North and South, the Nova Scotia of Canada, the New England, and then her time in Brazil and encountering that work and recognizing that a poet's voice could trace um, seemingly disparate um, geographies and map that. And this is Homecoming. And the form on the page sort of resembles what might look like a small a column in a small town newspaper when, when we still all read small town newspaper, <laughs> newspapers in print. Homecoming. White gloved and perched on the rear head of the chrome hubbed convertible, gleaming white in the Lake Huron sun, I am one of three girls chosen to be vestal virgins to the altar of white, Diana's maidens to the homecoming queen. Our white stockinged legs and polished white shoes brood statuesque over the rear 
red leather, our white eyelets shivering, our white ribbons flagging, our white gloved hands waving and waving and waving to the white faces lining the tree-lined streets, lining this small Scottish town. But the hand inside my glove is brown, and the face peeping from the white ruffled neck of my summer white dress is a beautiful hazelnut brown. This is my hometown. My legs, two severe batons, majorette the hot red leather. Even after the crowds thin out and the breeze off the lake picks up, even after the bagpipes keen moan fades, out past the Protestant Protestant oaks, out past the immigrant's bell-less church with its small brick frame, its gravel driveway, out towards the cornfields, when only Lake Huron with its lull of tall grasses and only the perennial pines wave back, I am still waving. Thank you. We'll hear from Carla now. That was wonderful. Thank you to the New England Poetry Board for honoring Blood Feather um, with this prize. It's an honor to have the prize for the book and to share it with the wonderful music for Exile. So double honored. Thank you so much. The poems some um, are, there are three long dramatic monologues that build this book. And so I'll read the last uh, poem. Um, the beginning of the last poem. So each of these dramatic monologues centers around a female artist. And I just feel that that's so apt with this company, all this rich work that uh, these amazing female artists have shared with us this afternoon. So I'm uh, really pleased to be ending the reading for you. So this uh, last dramatic monologue is an homage to Maya Darren, the filmmaker. And I'll read the, um, first five sections for you. I hope you enjoy it. Part first. In our only collaboration, I play a heroine possessed by spirits during the siege of Dubrovnik. In the first scene, I hear music nobody else can hear, drawing me down concrete stairs to a pebbled beach flanked by limestone fortresses, big tree bluffs, Adriatic opening and I float, a montage with views of the gate of Pila, the gate of Ploca, our creative project forms in slow water with shale deposits found in lakes and lagoon sediment. And in river deltas along floodplains, we ask what is the intrinsic nature of black and white film? In her 1947 essay, Creative Cutting, Maya Darren instructs that if the duration of a shot exceeds the duration of an action, there's a decrease in tension. Thus, Hesiod promises love's scarf protects the pulse at the throat, goals banking, goals plummeting, in and out the spotlight, our script, a collection of diagrams, old letters and news clips as we shift from the self as object to the self as process. Exterior entwines with history, interior becomes a desert film of uninhabitable regions where sandstorms articulate the psyche because to perform a woman possessed is to transform into a woman possessed. Part second. At each return, hold the camera in stillness, registering the inevitable shift of dunes, effacing wind lines, animal tracks. This is my material interior filmed at the height of the sternum, six inches from the chest. During the month of extreme convulsion, we speak of snow in the past tense, which does nothing to lessen the duration of April. On heavier days, I sink into the sorrel pasture's dank coat, finding creative vision and shale deposited on the continental shelf in deep quiet water, a process taking millions of years, as when you walk into the room, you let the breeze in, goals alternating the spotlight set to the spider lace scarf, edging hands, low distraction. Hesiod says love, if it is love, performs loosening, 
And for this reason, Darren writes, a static shot of a building becomes boring if held longer than identification or appreciation requires the camera dictating descend the stairs, nouning erosion, rebar, sand, the interior a desert of glass. Not until reviewing the footage did I realize you filmed me that morning half naked, wandering through sea holly and stone crop to graffitied ruins of the Hotel Belvedere Deluxe Dubrovnik, 17 stories of abandoned sand-colored stone cascading from cliff to sea. Part third, on off days securing shutters against the city center, I spend afternoons in bed watching YouTube videos of missiles launched into the fortress of the passing bell, into boats moored at the old port, while outside sun blares across limestone walls and tourists here in the midst of Adriatic floating, I discover filming the desert as the always present absence in the middle of a crowded room. Given a static shot of something, for example, a cliff skyscraper horizon, we know lasts longer than the duration of the shot. We feel nothing critical will happen to the object after it leaves our field of vision. Consequently, such camera work creates in relation to reality, no tension, wind gusting through an empty ballroom's chandelier, he see it says, but do not forget love, says the field extending under gulls, angling, the spotlight set to the heroic scarf brought to the lips. This is creation as facility, and we are shale splitting easily along the bedding plane into small thin lip fragments with rust strains from exposure of pyrite to air, blooming yellow efflorescent sulfur. And so yes, now split, now blossom part Fourth, in equating creative process with landscape undergoing rupture, we prepare to undergo the permeability of shale increased by force of fracturing fluid, injecting water, sand, and chemicals into sealed off portions of the borehole. On the nightstand, two forms of history, a black and white photograph featuring a limestone statue of Dubrovnik's patron protector, Saint Blaise, a model city cradled in his outstretched hands. This framed next to an artist's rendering of the Hotel Bavalier Deluxe, the angularity of 80s architecture softened by pastels expressive gestures, deluxe infloriated script. Sleepless, I focus on these images, overridden by goals ascending, goals wheeling, spotlight set to abstract the Hesiod scarf, worrying love's low breath, loosening limbs of love interior syntax cutting crescents over dunes as black and white film deepens our pleasure taken in the relation of illusion to optics. What if we are all just avoiding a natural state of uncertainty? The very last sequence of Darren's short dance film, a study in choreography for camera, provides an example of the use of duration as tension the dancer taking off from the ground for a leap, the shot cutting out while his body continues ascending the frame. Part fifth, this followed by a single slow shot against sky, legs traveling horizontally, the plateau of his leap followed by a shot in which he moves descendingly through the frame to land with such softness. In contrast, the force of applied pressure causes the formation to fracture. And what if we are not objects, but more properly acts of relation, our own apparent boundaries, a point of view created by static forms imposed on dynamic systems, such as the sensation of entering a darkened room, its context subsumed by sandalwood and leather. Deep in the ruins of the bombed out hotel, I found history unbroken China, embossed with the hotel's logo, packs of notepaper sealed in cellophane, receipts calculated in the Yugoslav dinar. Alone in the ruins, I speak a language I never learned, star dune, scythe dune, running parallel to wind over concrete and sand, goals plying, goals whittling over spotlights set to love the Hesiod scarf, 
drawing a low musical horizon, first electrified, then gone dim. I am perhaps too good at playing someone else's heroine. On the ferry to Havar, I take a compact from my purse, wind unscarving my hair. I peer into the reflection of my face, replaced by desert dunes, a crescent moon hung at the edge of a white sky. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Nesayu. Uh, Nesayu, thank you for bringing us uh, poems that, that uh, excavate um, and present important histories uh, and for, for poems that, that ring uh, in their compelling uh, sonic quality, in their song, they're, uh, they're, they're so beautiful in that way. Uh, and uh, Carla, uh, again, work that excavates and, and recuperates histories um, and uh, how history is written, where history is found. Uh, the loosening limb of love, interior syntax. I mean, there's so much. There's a uh, there's so much to consider uh, in your work. Uh, the use of duration as tension. Um, oh, I could <laughs> I could continue to speak uh, uh, about both your work, but I will but I will thank you <laughs> for it. We will thank you for it and congratulate you for these wonderful books, um, Blood Feather and uh, Music for Exile. Uh, and also thank uh, Kendra, Tyler, Zvinia, Ali, Catherine, and Denise. I think that is, uh, I think I've gotten everyone there. So um, congratulations to all the winners of this year. Uh, audience members, we wanna thank you for your presence. Uh, and for your poetry and for your membership uh, in the New England Poetry Club. And so let's uh, unmute and give the winners all a round of applause and some hoot. <laughs>